Okay. Not ready. Okay. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, so it's my pleasure to welcome Brit Sutton to the Vector Institute. Uh, we're very glad that uh, he could join us today and give a very, give a very interesting talk. We're all looking forward to it. Uh, Rich, of course, doesn't need much of an introduction. Uh, he is a distinguished research scientist at Deep Mind in Edmonton and a professor at the Department of Computing Science at the University of Alberta. Uh, I believe he joined in 2003. Before that, he was at industry working at AT&T and GP Labs and also in Academy of Massachusetts. He got his PhD uh, at the University of Massachusetts in 84 and a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology uh, from Stanford in 78. Uh, so uh, he's also a fellow of uh, Canadian Royal Society. He's, okay, so I guess it's a bit late, but uh, <laughs> he's a fellow of Royal Canadian Society, AAAI, CIFAR, and AMI. He has done a lot of great research in reinforcement learning and machine learning. Many of them are very influential and also is a co-author of the reinforcement learning textbook. Uh, and yes, so we are very much looking forward to your talk and please welcome me in joy, uh, join me in welcoming Rich. Thank you, Amir Masood. Um, this is the first time I've ever been here, the Vector. Uh, it's a pleasure to have this chance to talk to you all, to visit the sister institute of um, Amy, of Alberta's Amy, um, and to talk about uh, exchange ideas, really about the, the science of intelligence. It's important for all the centers to keep communicating and sharing ideas about, about the science. And I'd like to begin today um, yeah, actually, I have, I got, I'm doing something a little bit unusual for me. I've written out a lot of what, what I want to say. Uh, so if I, I look down and, and read stuff, don't be uh, uh, surprised. And uh, maybe you should be impressed that I thought so hard about what I'm going to say that I wrote it down. <laughs> or maybe you should feel insulted because I didn't practice it enough to, <laughs> I don't have to read it. But uh, so I'd like to begin today with some general remarks about the science of intelligence and the various fields that contributed. So by the science of intelligence, I mean the search for an understanding of intelligence, of what it is, about what we are, what mind is, what it is, and how it works, as opposed to the application of intelligence uh, in some automated form. Amazing progress has been made in the application of automated intelligence, and we all celebrate that, but we also have to keep working on the understanding, on the science, so that new applications can be found, and more importantly, so because it's just a fundamental uh, uh, challenge of, 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 of being a person, is that it, we, we've worked on this for thousands of years, since the ancient Greeks, and uh, well, we always want to understand what we are and, and how we work. And so I, I really think of it in those terms, first and foremost. Now, before I begin, I should say briefly that I don't see this genuine understanding of intelligence as something that's incredibly distant or far out of reach. There's certainly things we don't know yet, uh, but not enormously difficult things, and not things that we have no idea of how to approach. That's what I see things. Uh, so unlike some other AI res researchers, I see no huge mountains obstructing the way to understanding intelligence. I see hills. I see hills that we can expect to climb in good time with a sustained and concerted effort. We just have to apply ourselves in the right directions. It may take a decade or two or three, but we will get there. And when we do get there, it will seem to have come just as a normal course of the science. This is just a personal perspective, of course, but I hope that it provides some context for understanding how I am looking at this grand problem of understanding intelligence. So as you know, I am associated with the field of reinforcement learning, as is Amy, uh, Alberta generally, and even DeepMind generally. Um, you probably also know that Andy Barto and I wrote the main textbook on reinforcement learning. You may know that um, Martha and Adam White, two professors at, uh, at Amy, CIFAR chairs, 
they wrote and star in an online introductory course on reinforcement learning put out by Coursera. You should check it out if you haven't, haven't seen that. And you may also have a vague sense that DeepMind has been always, from its early days, associated with reinforcement learning. And that's true, and it's largely true today. Um, and per, for me personally, then, it's gratifying to see uh, so many landmark successes in reinforcement learning combined with deep learning. So things like TD Gammon, DQN, and AlphaGo, and AlphaZero, and AlphaStar. And just more to see the huge, diverse collection of research that different people are doing on reinforcement learning, motivated by these achievements and other things. So it's great to see reinforcement learning receive this level of widespread attention and respect. Okay, so that's all true. Um, but nevertheless, nevertheless, there's an important sense in which I'm disappointed by reinforcement learning's public image. So I'd like to try to correct some of that today. We all know about Jan LeCun's cake. I, th I think you all know. You all know about the, yeah? Well, for those of you who don't, the, he's basically saying that uh, reinforcement learning, if the, if the cake represents intelligence or the mind, uh, then reinforcement learning is just the cherry on the top. That the real body of it is, well, maybe the icing is supervised learning and maybe the, 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 the substance uh, of the cake itself is unsupervised learning. Most of it is unsupervised learning. That's his analogy. Um, so I, I think this metaphor uh, of Jan LeCun's, it, it accurately captures, represents uh, this common misperception that, that people have. Um, uh, it's often thought that reinforcement learning is just a small thing, just like trial and error learning, and, and that it does not even come close to being a complete theory of intelligence. Well, I want to say that that's not the case, at least for some of us. The ambition has always been for reinforcement learning to be a full, experience-based approach to intelligence in all of its aspects. <clears throat> so, those of you that have been paying, caring, paying careful attention to reinforcement learning ideas um, would know that at least 30 years ago, I proposed a reinforcement learning uh, model or an, some reinforcement learning ideas that could be used in conjunction with a model of the world and explain planning and reasoning. That's the system called DINA. Well, that's higher, not just trial and error learning. And 20 years ago, Doina Precup and Satinder Singh and I proposed that higher level models of the world expressed as extended ways of behaving called options. We propose this as a way of obtaining higher level planning and reasoning. Subsequent work, we argued that all knowledge of the world could be represented as option models and that these models could be learned efficiently in parallel with off policy learning methods. Well, the, these ideas of options and option models have always struck me as particularly uh, elegant, but they are also a little bit technical, okay? And uh, for example, Andy Bart and I chose not to include them in, in our textbook because they just, it was getting along enough. And um, so one, one of the most elegant aspects of these option models and the theory of planning that goes along with them is that the models of the world are temporally extended. And the result is advantageous to learn them by temporal difference methods, that is by reinforcement learning methods. Indeed, one could even learn, uh, could even form models of the world by planning methods, dyna-like planning methods, using lower level models to create the higher level models. In this way, all the parts of Jan LeCun's, Jan LeCun's cake end up being done by reinforcement learning methods. All of the things that he would, he would call unsupervised learning are all reinforcement learning meth methods. So the cake is all, is all reinforcement learning, not just the top. Um, so I'm basically saying that the ambition of reinforcement learning is to be theory of all of intelligence. It's always been that way. And several of us have been working on that and, and putting it out there and we're publishing it. Like the, the work on options, you know, it's highly cited. It's, it was recently um, 
got an award for a classic paper from the Artificial Intelligence Journal. So people are aware of it, but still, as I said, it's a little technical. It's like how many people really got to chapter 13 of the reinforcement learning textbook and all the details of eligibility traces. Not that many people do. Uh, you really have to work hard, and you know, you'd rather, you'd rather you know, learn about something new, I don't know, in GANs or, or something, <laughs> LSTMs. Uh, Where's, yeah. So, I'll talk a bit more about planning with options in a while, when I, if I get, ever get done with these general introductory remarks. Um, but for now, I just want to make it the point that reinforcement learning researchers, some of us at least, have been thinking about this full, ambitiously complete understanding of, of intelligence for some time. Now, I wouldn't mind if people thought that this reinforcement learning approach to intelligence was insufficient. That would be fine. But I'm really disappointed to realize that people don't even see it as an ambition, don't even see it as a proposal. Um, and so, in retrospect, I, I think it's at least partly my fault and the fault of people doing that. You know, we all do this. I always, I always, when every time a, a, a new graduate student will give a talk, I will say, I, I always want to say, you know, you know, new graduate student, you are. Um, you are so telling us about the details, you're not telling us about the main point. And uh, so I think I myself have been guilty of this. I haven't said the main point. I've been assuming that everyone knew the main point. Everyone knew the main point. I was we were trying to figure out all of intelligence. We're trying to do it with simple reinforcement learning methods. Obviously, we're doing that. I don't, I don't have to say that. We didn't say it. Most of it makes oh, okay, there's a few papers out there that say it, but you'd have to look, you'd have to really be paying attention. Um, so basically I'm saying my colleagues and I have not been sufficiently explicit about our ambition. We've not been sufficiently loud in expressing these larger ambitions of reinforcement learning. So let me say it now. Reinforcement learning is a problem. And that problem includes all of the problems of intelligence. It expresses all those problems in a simple form, uh, but it's a complete form. Um, they're all there, all those problems are there. So to solve this, this reinforcement learning problem would be to fully solve the problem of intelligence. And this is the larger uh, ambition of reinforcement learning. We've been doing it for, for decades. Um, the, under, the, the understanding of intelligence that I have sought includes all aspects, things like perception, action, planning, abstract reasoning, and all the rest, whatever they may end up being. So in many ways, reinforcement learning has a greater claim to this ambition than many other paradigms, such as uh, logic and such as deep learning, uh, to take two extremes that are often mentioned as candidates for explaining all of, all of intelligence. So I would just like reinforcement learning to be taken seriously as a way of understanding intelligence, since all you thought leaders out there, if you'll hear me and maybe try thinking that way. Okay, I'm not quite done uh, with my introduction. Uh, now some of you, I wanna switch now though to just end talking about the, the problem of reinforcement learning and how general it is and start talking about an approach that could be very general. So now some of you uh, may, have taught, may have attended my talk at the University of Toronto in the Computer Science Department um, what, four years ago, in which I argued that the future of AI belonged to search and learning because these are the two methods that, that um, scale in effectiveness with a steady increase in computer power. So you all know about Moore's laws and how it's been brought, brought us all this increasing power per dollar, computation per dollar, and how important that is as we um, think about AI. Or you may have read my blog post on the bitter lesson, which reached the same conclusion. We have to do search and learning, we have to do general methods. It reached the same conclusion by reflecting on the history of the successes and failures in AI over its 70 year history. So the ideas that I'm gonna tell you about today are an attempt to take that lesson to heart, to try to reach an understanding of intelligence and how to create artificial intelligence that leverages only methods that scale with computer power. And so a little bit of a, of a 
restriction, a uh, limitation, uh, a discipline that we're going to try to impose on ourselves. So as we proceed in this, there are several things you should realize at the outset about this endeavor. First and foremost, it's somewhat abstract and unfamiliar. Uh, it will appear minimalist and reductionist. The whole point is to leave out things that other researchers, and we ourselves, might have been tempted to build in. We will not try to build in special mechanisms to understand the physical world, uh, but rather leave that in all its particularities to be captured by general learning methods. So we're not going to build in objects. We're not going to build in space. Um, yeah. The bitter lesson is that building in intuitions about your, your own mind, I imagine you work, has always lost out eventually to methods that scale with computation. And so I want to leave out all these things. I want to leave out space and objects and symmetries and even convolution. In fact, I want to leave out prior knowledge in general, not because it's, it's uh, bad, but we're just not interested in prior knowledge. It's beside the point. It's a distraction. Um, if the degree we focus on that, well, I'm sure our systems will work slightly better, but uh, it pulls us away from methods that will scale as computer power keeps coming online. And so, so we've seen this. Let me actually say, remind you of a couple examples of that. And in some sense, the whole point of the whole thrust of the deep learning revolution is that general methods are much better than trying to build in uh, features for speech recognition or features for for vision or for language, um, it's better to leave that to the machine, and, and that's why we have all the, the great progress in those areas. Uh, you all see it much older. It's happened many, many times. Uh, remember the chess programs decades ago? Um, it turned out people always tried to put in their own their own sense of how they played, uh, but then the best results were obtained by methods just just did a big search. Those are, those are, that was the breakthrough. And the, and the, old, the latest systems, Alpha Zero, Alpha Zero has no no chess knowledge in it. It's the same program that plays computer Go and plays uh, uh, Japanese chess. Um, and it doesn't have an opening book. It doesn't have an end game database. Uh, it doesn't know, doesn't know that a pawn is worth one point and a bishop is worth three points. That was left out. And it was, it was a win. It was actually much better to leave all those things unsaid and let the machine figure it out from data. <clears throat> so, the bitter lesson is not a call for ignoring what we know about the mind. It's a call to be mistrustful of what we think we know. And it is often wrong, and, and it's a distraction, pulls us in the wrong direction. Okay, now, with all the specific things, I guess I want to say this point too. This suggests, the bitter lesson suggests, taking an approach that's minimalist and reductionist. Minimalist and reductionist. Good things, you know, those should have a good feel for you. It's minimal, it's reducing things, but just a little bit challenging. You're reducing it. Have you really kept all the right things? Have you lost something? Um, it, search and learning, scaling with Moore's Law, strongly suggests that this will be a winning strategy. So I'm, gonna, I'm just trying to try to pursue it. Prior knowledge, we're gonna, they're not part of this approach. It's not, not there. You can't use them, but they're not part of the approach. They're on the side. They're, they may get in the way, may distract you from what's really needed. Okay, so with um, so many specific things omitted, the problem of intelligence becomes easier in a sense because you only have some, a fewer things to work with, and so you may be able to see from that discipline of what you need to do. But it's also much harder. You know, how can you develop your intuitions when there's so little to go on? We need something to replace the conventional starting points. We need some constraints, something to provide direction, something to point us in the right way. Ideally, the answer would be first principles. Uh, first principles of intelligence, what's the basic aspects of the problem? Um, and that's the challenge, to find the first principle constraints that lead us to agent designs. What are the essential properties of the problem of intelligence? What can we say about it that's fully general? Okay, now a good place to start is with a definition. Like, what is this thing I've been talking about, intelligence? Um, and so we can look 
into the long history of people thinking about it. And we can find William James, uh, like the original psychologist, 1890, he defined, uh, he, actually, he actually defined mind. The hallmark of mind is attaining consistent ends by variable means. So I like that because there's no buzzwords, uh, and yet it expresses the main idea of having a goal. Consistent ends by variable means. The, the animal varies what he does in order to get the same thing. That's a goal. And this same idea of goals is stated more explicitly in the best artificial intelligence definition. This is from John McCarthy, the guy who coined the phrase artificial intelligence. Um, so he said he defined intelligence as the computational part of the ability to achieve goals. So a couple of nice things. He's talking about goals, like that's like William James. Uh, but he's, he's talking about, he's, he's expressing the idea that it's an ability and uh, it's, that, that is the computational part of that ability. Like if, you can, if you're like a steamroller and you're really strong and big, you may be able to achieve the goals of making things flat, but it's, it's not the computational part that you're doing. Okay, so and I, looked in, I looked at the dictionary. What does just a regular dictionary would say for defining intelligence? And the dictionary on, on my computer, on my laptop, uh, describes it as the ability to acquire and apply knowledge and skills. And I am, I am happy with that. And now we're circling in that it's an ability and it has something to do with, with goals. Um, these are all great. I'm in rough agreement with them. And they all have distinct advantages. So definitions, I give three definitions. They don't compete with each other. Um, they, they, they add. Now, you have to pick one when you're going to actually do some work. Um, different definitions are useful for different purposes. Their primary function is providing clarity and discipline. When someone makes a de definition, the primary point is that it makes clear how they are using the word and what they mean by it. You can hold them to that. Um, so all that being said, the definition that's most useful for my purposes, and that I will use here, is more specific than these. It'll be just a little bit longer. Um, so let me first be a little bit more definite about my setting. So it comes no surprise that I'm going to choose a reinforcement learning setting, in which an agent interacts with an external environment, emitting actions, uh, ob receiving observations, and seeking to maximize a designated signal, uh, designated observation called the reward. So the purposes of this talk, and then I'm going to define intelligence as the computational part of the ability to predict and control the stream of observations. So the computational part of the ability to predict and control a stream of experience. Yeah, so I'm going to use the word experience. That does just mean the observations and actions that are generated in interaction with the world. And we're particularly interested in controlling the part of that stream that's called, that's a scalar and that's called reward. Okay, so I originally had planned to um, uh, proceed a little bit farther from first principles, and you'll see some echoes of that as we go forward. Um, yeah, but let me turn now to a more conventional way of speaking. So I'm going to talk about towards a scalable AI agent architecture. So an outline then would be these five topics, basic premises, a lot of which I've already said. And we'll talk about predictions as the key uh, representation of knowledge. We'll plan with them. And then we're going to be very important is going to be this idea of having sub-problems. And they give you structure and uh, give you options and option models. And then I have tried to put everything together into something I call super Dyna for now. So the premise is, of course, as, I, as I've expressed, we see general principles for learning to predict and control experience. When we're interested in the domain independent part of intelligence, not this part that's specific to the particular world we live in. Um, and I'm going to accept the reward as a representation of the goal. It's, it's adequate, certainly. And I'm, I would argue, if I wanted to bore you about further abstract things, that it's necessary. Uh, but even though that's true, it's going to nevertheless also be true that most learning that goes on is not going to be solely about the reward. That's the ultimate goal, but that's not the only kind of learning that's going on. So we need these four things. Uh, any, any general approach is going to have to, to understand the intelligence, going to have to have 
function approximation. It's going to have to partial observability. You can't observe the whole state of the world. You are going to have to abstract over time, and you're going to have to be able to deal with non-stationary worlds. So the way I think about this is that the world over there is much bigger than the agent. Um, the world actually can say contains many other agents, so this is definitely going to be true. And of course, we only see a small part of it at a time. Um, and that there's a consequence of this that your the agents, you, yours, your approximations have to forever be genuinely approximate, genuinely approximate. So uh, we often violate this whole thing in our in our deep reinforcement learning methods, like in Atari. The world is actually smaller than the agent. The, wor the, the world is like this Atari game that is held in like 4K of memory, and the agent is like all of all of Google scale computing. Okay, um, and I think that ends up being important. That shapes what we do and how we what we try to do. Um, really, the world is much more much larger, and so we can only approximate it because we only have so many parameters. The world is vastly larger. Now the last sentence, last word, it has, uh, is, is going to be something that I keep coming back to. Um, so, so I brought in the approximate and um, non-stationary here is that the world is going to appear time varying because it's much bigger, and we'll see one we'll see one part of the world, and things we'll we'll learn about that, like you know when you're on the beach, and you get all the sand, and you have to walk in a certain way, and then later you start walking somewhere else. And rather than like learning two policies that you can snap in absolutely each time you go from from the beach to to a hard street, uh, you just you just adapt as you go along. So your the world appears non-stationary, and you you uh, adapt to that variation. Well, these are the base the main starting points. Okay, now now let's talk about partial observability. Partial observability, uh, the best way to talk about that is in terms of pictures. So this is our standard reinforcement approach. This is the agent. The agent, the world. Agent, the world. The agent generates actions, receives states, receives rewards. And, and as a, through this interaction, it adjusts its policy pi and maybe its approximate value function v hat. OK, so I think you uh, maybe have seen something like that. and. Uh, so to add partial observability, we're just going to add this separate box, little box, deceptively box perhaps, which is which I call U for update, state update. So this instead of instead of uh, having the world generate states, we're going to generate observations. So like sensor readings, okay? And using those observations, and I, we have we also have to pull the action in. Uh, I just draw it again here, and we use those two together with the last state to produce the next state. Okay, now this stuff will, goes on all the time. It goes on at the speed of interaction with the world, the speed of reaction. This is all fast, and also notice so it's because every time step you have to see an, a state, you have to compute a state in order to send it to the policy and pick an action. So. Uh, now notice that the agent, the thing that we was the agent here, uh, received state, and that guy received state. So actually, we haven't had to change this part. What used to be the whole agent, that part is we we're going to conserve that. Re re uh, we've reduced uh, the full problem with observations to the problem where we're given states. They're just agent states. They're not. They're the agent's representation of the state. They're not the so-called true state of the world. Okay, so let me make a little space here and keep going because I want to bring in um, the, the remaining bits. So the remaining bits, um, well, first, all learning is going to be based on online TD prediction, flexibly long-term, action conditional. We have this term called general value functions or GVFs, which is, represents the idea of it of a general form of, of uh, online TD predictive of value function that can be used for knowledge, any kind of knowledge, and can be learned online by TD methods. OK, so I'm going to need these four components, these four specific components to finish making uh, a, a model of intelligence. So I'm going to need state features. And really, that's what 
you is about who is going to the state and the state features that I'll, uh, it'll have to be ongoing because our representation of the world has to improve as we understand the world better and better. If you're forming concepts, those concepts will be features. So that's you. It's going to be uh, change, change. So we're going to construct it. Construct it means we are spending time working on it long, over a long period of time, like a lifelong learning kind of long. And uh, so we construct the state features. And we're going to also construct subproblems. We're going to keep coming back to that. Uh, but, uh, and then we're going to make solutions to the subproblems. So I have a picture that sort of suggests that. Uh, the solutions to the subproblems are going to be options. And an option is going to be a policy and a way of terminating. It's going to be like another problem. So this is the, this going back here is supposed to represent here I'm working on all these subproblems as well as the main problem. And so now I've got multiple uh, things that are working in parallel. And these things I'm trying to learn, you know, I'm going to learn how to pick up an object. I'm going to learn how to walk maybe to the restroom. I'm going to learn how to travel to uh, Edmonton. Maybe I know how to travel to Edmonton. But I have all these subproblems, and I've learned how to, how, to, how to do them and their value functions. So I have a policy and value function for each one, and there are many of them. And this gives me temporal abstraction. Now I can think about traveling to Edmonton and then, and then taking a taxi and going home and and having a cup of tea. So, uh, well, you know, in order to think about all those things, you don't need more than just the options, the ways of behaving. I also need to have models of the way, of those ways of behaving. That is, things that tell me, if I was to do one of these, where would I end up? Now, the word model is, is unfortunately a bit conflicted in, in our field. Um, you guys are all used to uh, thinking about deep learning, and you always use model for the network. Um, you wouldn't say policy, you would say the model. Okay? Well, I'd like to reserve the word model for model of the world. Model of the, how the, wor the agents model of the world. Um, so that model, yeah, we learn it from experience, and then we can query it with possible states and options, things we might do, and it would tell us where we, where we end up. So that's where we have the world model. It has to be suitable for planning. OK, now all of these things are basic, basic needs. We have to have a model. We have to have uh, higher level structures based on subproblems. We'll be getting into that. Um, but even though each one is basic, any, all of them, you really can't find a system which, which achieves all of them. So it's not trivial to, to, to try for this. OK, now, there's many, many aspects, and I can't really talk about all of them. But I have to at least mention them. Like state update, I'm glad I mentioned it. And I'll just mention on one slide more, which is that we have some state features. Like this is a feature. We have We see a new observation, a new action. Take the last state vector, and together, we form the new. Well, that's going on and on and on, and we're using it to make our, all of our predictions. So write an equation. The new feature vector x is some function u of the old feature vector, and so forth. This thing is going to be nonlinear. This might be linear. Um, so the big, big deal will be how do you find the right features, and that's really representation learning. And maybe you're going to do gradient descent. Maybe you're going to do uh, some, some search, some generate and test. Select the survival, uh, generate a large variety of features, and select keep the ones that are most used. And you can use the, uh, you can you that, figure out the basis, are they used or not by looking at their connections to the predictions. And then you can rank the features by their utility and curate them, keep the good ones, make, discard the bad ones, generate new ones, you know, curate in the sense of collect a, a stable of, of really good features that you gradually improve. And the most useful features, they will become the, the targets of subproblems. OK, so that word subproblems keeps coming up. But we're not quite yet ready to adjust it directly. Um, my outline, we're like halfway through, even though my time is mostly gone. But, but um, we're going to talk a little bit about planning. So planning is based on the Dyna architecture. The Dyna architecture um, is just basically that planning and learning are radically similar. So like, here's, here's our 
reinforcement learning algorithm interacting with the world, you know, actions, it's and reward. And then we're just going to replace uh, the world by the model of the world and keep going. And that's basically the way we, we do planning. Okay? Um, so this, this is an old system. This is from 1990. And you, the, the algorithm is expressed in that one page of pseudocode. And um, let's talk briefly about what's going on here. We have a grid world, states, and um, uh, the four actions up, down, right, and left. And the green represents the value function, how well it thinks it's doing, so it knows that places that are close to the, that lead to the goal are, are, are good. And the arrows represent which the policy, which way it thinks, which actions it thinks uh, it should do, and particularly those are the action values of each of the four actions. Now, since this is a Dyna system, in addition to learning policy and value function, uh, it's also learning a model. That's not um, represented here, but the model is, um, visually, it's not represented. Something like in state, you know, 14, and I do action two, I end up in state 96. Okay? This is a very simple system from 1990. Um, it's all tabular. It's all tabular. It assumes that I'm, I'm told the states. It's also one step. I learn a model that says, if I'm one step, I'm here, and I do action two, and the next step, I will be there. These are all limitations of that earlier system that we want to get rid of today. Okay, but the good thing is we are integrating actions, acting in real time. Uh, it's doing model-free reinforcement learning. It's also learning a model. And it's also planning. How do you do planning? Planning each for each real step in the world. You imagine in this case in your head. And imagine well, what, what some state I've been to before. I've been to state state forty-two, and what's some action I did there? I've done action three, and it took me to this state uh, uh, forty-three. Okay, and so then you imagine that happening in your head and the reward that you received on it from the model, and then you learn from that imagined transition again. So that's the whole, the whole bit of Dyna. So trivial. Um, uh, the, but yeah, it's, the key point is that it, it learns quickly. I don't know if you've been noticing, but when the goal is moved into a new place, it, it takes a while to find it, but when it finds it, it then replans to get to that new place very quickly. Well, maybe we can watch one of those without me going on. So when it finally gets there, now it's all being filled in, and it's already got the optimal policy. No, not, now, it, now it's got the optimal policy. Okay, whereas if it was just trial and error learning, it would take a while to do that. And that's why we, it was it's a demonstration of the utility of planning, even though it's very simple. Okay, now the kind of planning we're talking about, I like to call dynamic programming style planning. It's not that different from all the ones you used to, Monte Carlo tree search and, and look ahead trees. It's just a little bit uh, structured differently so it can be done incrementally and based on memory. So in dynamic programming style planning, planning proceeds, looking ahead from states, imagining something about the future, and go a little bit faster now. Each imagining is called a look ahead, and after some number of look aheads, you, uh, after the look ahead, you do some backups. So this is a look ahead. Right? Here's a, these are diagrams of the book. Here's a state, and the solid ones are actions. So here's a state. You have a choice of various actions. Model for, to look ahead. Okay? Um, so that's, so you can also do look aheads on a more uh, a sample base. So here's a state and, and an action we're thinking about doing, and, we, and, and the, the projection or the look ahead tells us only one state, like a sample next state. And so these are all projections. Here's some really short and thin uh, uh, look aheads. And, and then the backing up process is we take something at the end and back it up to, to change the value of the starting place, the value, maybe the policy of, of the starting state. So here we look ahead a couple of steps, two projections, and then we back up to improve the estimate at the first state. And here, The result is kind of the same because, like, if, particularly if we do this up to the top, if those if the intermediate state is the same state, and that's how we can plan arbitrarily, even though we do single steps. And like Dyna, it does absolutely single steps all the time. Um, so if we and we just keep doing this forever, we keep doing these kind of tiny little planning bits, and together they uh, they get us a, a good plan. 
Okay, now very quickly, uh, let's think now what we mean by a model, a model of the world, uh, and what is its inputs and outputs. So its inputs is going to be a state, that'll be an agent state, and uh, an action, or more generally, it'll be an option. Okay? Something, you, some place you might be, and something you might do. And the, the question is, what should the output be? If you're in that place and you do that thing, because uh, many things could happen. The world is stochastic. So you, you could represent the whole distribution. I think that's challenging. But that's what classically we do in dynamic programming. We have a distribution over the next state. Um, and it's to try to do what's often called rollouts, where you go ahead one step and then you go on another step from there. That's easy to do with what I call a sample model, where the output of the model is a, a sample next state instead of a distribution. Sample model. This could be, then be rolled out because it gets you a ground state. And, and you, but you still have to learn this whole distribution in order to generate the samples. And notice that now planning becomes stochastic. This is what happens in Monte Carlo tree search. We have to do a, a lot of it in average over the samples. And the third, yeah. yes. Good. I mean, if I have a distribution, yep. you can draw a sample from that. Yep. Yep. Well, the distribution model is meant to be the idea of producing the distribution as the output of the model. Whereas in this case, you might okay. produce that as an intermediate step, and then you sample it, and you end up with just a sample next state. Okay, good. And the third possibility is that you generate an expected feature vector, an expected next feature vector. Um, so, because the, the result is a feature vector. The distribution over possible feature vectors is a big deal. Um, so what if we just generate the average of all the next feature vectors? Okay, maybe seem like a naive idea. The, the next state is kind of blurry or averaged. In general, this can't be rolled out. Um, but learning is straightforward and everything remains deterministic. And in general, we lose information, but not in the special case. So I just want to show you that. Uh, so this equation is the equation for value iteration. So it's the equation for the standard dynamic programming way of improving the value function. Um, at least it would be if it wasn't for this part. If I just changed uh, my S approximate tabular value function for this, some state equal to the max of, uh, of look at what's the expected reward for doing this choice O, max over all choices, actions, or options. If I, if I uh, take the expected, one, expected reward for that step, and I, I take the, the probability distribution over what the next state might be, so this is a distribution model, and I sum all those and the value of the result state. So that's the usual uh, value iteration, uh, except for this bit I'm saying we're going to approximate the value function. It's actually going to be of this specific form, of a linear form. So some weights, inner product with some feature vector for the state. So in this, and that corresponds to the picture. That does the backup from, from here to there. So that is value iteration with a distribution model. And I want to show, show you that you can get exactly the same thing. So the theorem is that if the approximate value function is linear, this is linear, uh, then value iteration with an expectation model is going to be exactly equivalent to this, this with a distribution model, full distribution model. And so the, theory, the, the proof is, is, is really trivial. We replace the uh, approximation with the particular linear form, and then we can gather up all the, we basically want to pull the weights outside, so we flip the inner product, and then we pull all the, put all the feature vectors inside the sum, and yeah, and so then that thing, the, this is summing over next states, what's the probability of that state happening once it's feature vector? Well, that is the expected next feature vector. So that's what we call that. Okay, and so x hat times inner product with W is exactly the, the whole expression. I have, there's been no approximations. Um, and this is the, uh, so that's how we, we uh, for the linear case, we lose nothing. So when you have to ask if we, if we are going to be content with linear, linearity, um, um, and basically I think we can be, because we are linear in constructed features. And if, even if you think of a, a deep neural network, 
uh, you construct the, la the next to last layer and the, the final output is linear generally often in those last layers. So you can, so this is really end up being a burden on the state, on the feature construction or the state feature construction and not, not, not really a, a limitation of the algorithm. Uh, so I kind of I can summarize that by this is maybe some of you may recognize, recognize this diagram from the reinforcement. We have the four basic kinds of updates. Well, these also are four could be seen as four basic kinds of, of planning updates. Um, so, like Dinah does this this update, and the proposal is that the simple form up there in the corner, where we do an expectation update, uh, is sufficient for everything. It can give us general planning. Okay, so uh, as I expected, you can't do everything. You have to have that long introduction. But I want to give you some sense of, of the importance of subproblems. And the best way to do that is to talk about play. And the best way to talk about play is to just show pictures of playing things. Okay? So this is an orangutan that's, that's just trying, exploring its body, seeing what it can do. Uh, what kind of interesting sensations it can get. Those are some cats. Cats are always playing, and you know, we love to look at them. Uh, this is an orca who's playing around with a, a bottle, and even lizards will play. And we know that people and, and kids play. And like this child, is, this little girl is playing with her hands, like trying to figure out how they work. She's not trying to get reward, I don't think. Uh, but she's working on some problems. And you know, you work on play, even like you play soccer or, or chess or, or just you know, how you walk, or how you surf. All play involves goals, but, then there, but there are sub goals. You, you set out, I want to learn, I want to be able to stand up when I surf. Not because it's, I'm going to get reward necessarily. Oh, look, there's my feet. Now they're really interesting too. Um, so reinforcement learning, we're used to talking about on air learning, back functions and policies. But the next thing we have to learn, the state features, we have to learn the skills or options, we have to learn models of the world. And I think the key to all of these is, sub, is to formulate the idea of subproblems and play. And this is not an, a new idea. Of course, there's a long history of thinking about that, dating, dating back at least it's mentioned by Schmidt Huber. Um, and there are some settled problems, subproblems, are a reward signal and possibly a terminal value, some combination of that. And also, I think we can say that it's a settled answer that the solution to a subproblem is an option. It's just a policy and a way of terminating. It's, it's pretty much got to be those two things, a policy and a way of terminating, and that's what an option is. Um, so the open questions are, what should those subproblems be? We, dis we disagree about that. It's not clear. Uh, where do those subproblems come from? And, and how, are, how are the main ways they help on the main problem? And so I have some answers to those proposed answers. Let's just, uh, primarily the way we help the main problem is by enabling planning at a high level. So I want to look at basically this progression. We're going to have a subproblem, sub then and as I work on the subproblem, I will learn a way of behaving that, that, that succeeds at, 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 at doing well on that subproblem. And then uh, once I have that way of behaving, I will learn a model of, the, of it. I will learn how it transitions, takes me from one state to another. Um, and it comes back, planning helps when states change their values. You remember I talked about that at the very beginning. And we can formulate that in terms of uh, having, uh, I won't go through all this, uh, in terms of have, having uh, permanent and transient weights, uh, both at the same time, and arranged in a cascade. And you can show how having two sets of weights, one which kind of settles on, on the ideal values, if you only have, you could only have one, uh, you can do better than that if you, um, in, in, for example, Computer Go. So here's some comparisons, head-to-head -head comparison between uh, a method that has only one set of weights and converges to the best set of weights. And another system that has two sets of weights, one that converges to the best one, and the other one which continues, which transiently adapts to, to the particular game you're in. Remember, remember I talked about walking at the beach and adapting to that? Uh, and and because the world is really big, so Go is really big, and you only have a limited number of function number of parameters in your in your value function, in your function approximator. And even here, we can show that you're much better off 
by recognizing that non-stationarity of the world. So it's good. And then that is going to allow me to, in a summary form, give you my answers to the three main questions in subproblems, which, which is, and let's start with the second one. Where do the subproblems come from? So the subproblems come from the state features. Remember, I have some process for constructing new state features. And I'm keeping track of the state features, which ones are most useful, which ones are less useful, which one I thought might be useful, but just turned out to be a waste of time. I'm going to rank them. And, and uh, I'm going to make one subproblem for each feature. Each feature who's, who makes a, a significant contribution to the value function. Actually, whose contribution to the value function is, is variable, is, is uh, non-stationary. So that, this, this, and the specific form, so what should the problems be? They seek to maximize the, their feature. Uh, that is, they seek to uh, re reach a terminal state at which the feature is high while respecting the original rewards. So my proposal will be use the original rewards, don't introduce any new novelty to the rewards, uh, but achieve that feature. And specifically, uh, when, we, when we terminate, we get a, a, a bonus. And the bonus, uh, so it's like a terminal reward, is the value of that feature we end up in uh, plus uh, uh, the value of the state we run. This is, this is the, value, the value of the state we run into at, at that termination time t. And we get a bonus for uh, the, uh, the particular feature, i, being high, um, and proportional to its, its variability, its standard deviation. So things that vary in their values. Um, become uh, goals. And then how do we help on the main problem? Well, the solution to the subproblem is an option that maximizes its feature. And so, and, and the features vary in value. So, so with these, you can form models. If you have models of those options, they will tell you how to achieve things that are sometimes useful and sometimes not. Like if it was always useful, you would need to learn an option. You would just always do it. But if things are sometimes useful and sometimes not, then you want to be able to plan, oh, I could go there. Let me see if I think it's a good thing to do now. So a sort of summary of where we are so far, and maybe I'm not going to go appreciably farther. Um, a fully capable reinforcement learning agent must learn larger things. It has to learn things like state features, options, and models of the world. And the key to all of these things is the notion of a subproblem, in particular, I'm proposing this uh, notion of subproblem that, that is pr problems of state feature attainment, respecting the original rewards. This is a distinctive kind of subproblem and it fits well into representation learning and fits well into planning. Um, because the world is big, we have to approximate. This means it will appear to change, we'll have to track it, and that's ultimately why planning makes sense. I think it's also ultimately why generalization makes sense. The world is big, we're encountering it over and over again as we recur, as the states of the world recur. The changes in our approximate value function tell us which features should be the focus of our representation, subproblems, models, and planning. So um, I never really expected to talk much about Superdyna. Uh, it has gotten a lot simpler as, a, as some pseudocode. Pseudocode now fits easily on one page. and and uh, it just has the four steps of interacting with the world, learning from that interaction, uh, planning, uh, imagining future things, just like before we imagined um, uh, tabular. We asked the model. We're asking the model, and if you're in the state vector and you were to do that option omega, um, what would be the next expected next reward feature vector and the expected uh, reward? And so we plan for all these things, and everything is represented as general value functions. And because of that, we have learning algorithms for them. OK, so these are all the conclusion, then, is these are all steps towards the first complete AI agent architecture that's scalable, scale with computation, and has, has not learning, leaning on any built-in things. It has the most important capabilities. It has acting, learning, planning, model learning. It has subproblems and options. It has function approximation, par partial observability, it handle non-stationarity, and stochastic worlds. It has discovery or construction of the state features, at least uh, as a placeholder. And so therefore, we can also discover the subproblems, the options, and the models. 
And all these things then feed, feed back to motivate um, new features. So you can think about this cycle here. Um, we, have, we, have, uh, uh, we have some state features, so we form the subproblems. We work on the subproblems, we find the options, and then we want, um, we form models of those uh, options. And all of these are new, new prediction problems. Like even a model is a whole bunch of prediction problems. What will happen? What, are, what will happen to all the state features if I do that option? And so those prediction problems um, inform your features. It says, oh, I'm finding this feature useful and that feature not useful. And so as you go along, you, you get more and more information about the utility of the state features. And that, that motivates you and, and informs you as which features are useful. And that's what we need in order to come up with good state features and keep the cycle going. So really, as we get back here, we come up with new state features. We get those new state features. We have new subproblems, new options, new models. All these things generate, evaluate, and therefore generate um, new state features. And the cycle continues. So that is the idea of the ambition of reinforcement learning to do all of intelligence. Thank you very much. Let's take a few minutes to ask questions. Some of you have traveled. You don't want to, I'm going to use the time. Um, hey, thanks for the talk. Um, in your uh, premises slide in the second bullet point, I think it said something to the effect of we don't want to care about our, the world, and or we don't want to maybe uh, focus on a space, or the features of our, the world that we live in. Earlier, you also mentioned priors are a distraction. Yep. My, uh, my question is, how does that square with um, no free lunch theorem for um, search and optimization? That's a very good question. Um, the, the answer is from the idea that the world is complex and therefore non-stationary. Mm -hmm. No free lunch theorem is a theorem about um, insufficient information. I don't think that the problem of intelligence is an information problem. I think it's a computational problem. So we, our, our mind is only so big. So we have to allocate those resources, and that's why we can, that's what I was trying to allude to, and I said, we really need this perspective even to talk about generalization and learning. Thank it's you. meant to actually solve that dilemma, the dilemma of the no free lunch theorem. Thanks. Just raise your hand if you have a question. Back there. We'll pass the mic back. I, I've tried to say some controversial things, so you must have some questions. Uh, and and uh, yeah, this is this is what it means to, you know, Cameron was asking me about how we form confidence as a researcher, and we we form confidence is really in, in, part of it is inviting questions and welcoming. Because after you've talked for a while. Uh, you don't worry about trying to impress people. You just worry about communicating to people. And uh, so, you know, a question, even if the question is a, is a rejection of everything you've said, uh, at least they're paying attention. You know, at least they're, you've said something that, that, that they can know and understand is wrong. Okay? So I really would like to hear your questions. Uh, I'll ask probably a dumb question. Uh, about the variability. There are no dumb questions, except for the question you wanted to ask, but you didn't. Well, I'll try That's to a dumb I'll, question. So you're going to solve ask that. You will question. ask the question. <laughs> um, about the variability with time. Yeah. Um, how do you arrange that your, uh, that the time scale of your process is appropriate for the time scale of the way the world is actually changing? Because it could be orders of magnitude off and things would be all confusing? So there are a number of techniques for, for uh, adapting to the time scale of the world. Um, I'm thinking most specifically of some work that, that, that I've done on, on step size adaptation. So you can learn uh, what, what is too fast, what is too slow. This, this is a, uh, almost a primary instance of representation, how you decide uh, where to attribute uh, the uh, the changes that you observe. 
which is ultimately a question of determining the scale, the time scale of, of different variations in the world. So, so perhaps related to that, do you, do you see multiple levels of temporal abstraction and multiple levels, multiple different types of state features depending upon? Absolutely. That's really what I like about it. options enable you to have uh, arbitrary scales, but but the, the, one of the most intriguing aspects of them is it's it's still flat. You don't have explicit levels. You don't have like there's this level and then that builds only on this level. You just have at a flat, I can either I can either travel to Toronto or I can twitch this muscle, okay? And you can they 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 are in the same max, the same uh, uh, value duration update. Um, but we absolutely want to have multiple levels that build build upon each other. Uh, well, not levels, multiple abstractions that build on other ones. You can even you could there's no there's really isn't a direction. A high level thing can build on a, on a lower level thing. Uh, a fairly low level thing can have as part of its components a higher level thing. If, if no one else asks you a question, then maybe at the end you could comment on memory, but, but I'll, I'll cede the, the mic. So I'm not an AI person, but I care about uh, controlling large scale systems, um, are, such as yeah. resource allocation in clouds or the, uh, the messaging systems that back uh, uh, Facebook. And uh, these systems are comprised of many sub-components, uh, and they need to be optimally allocated and uh, tuned. Now, they can't be played like games, because if you do something wrong, then Facebook doesn't work anymore. Now, any thoughts on using reinforcement learning in a context like that? So that, you know, there's different kinds of people in the world, and I understand how you might ask that question, because you see very often systems like that, but I is uh, thought primarily about systems like that. It's the game case where you have a model, a completely accurate model, and you can go fiddle with it without any cost. That that is uh, a special case, uh, and not the central case. The central case of reinforcement learning is you do things and you suffer the. You have to actually care about the the, the the rewards that you get. If you get bad rewards for a while, that is bad. They're not like a test reward. That should be considered the central case of reinforcement learning. Um, in my opinion, that's what we think primarily about. So maybe the closest thing, there's some examples in the book where we're doing uh, like logistics problems. We have, we're trying to service a queue and we care about, uh, the only way we can find out about the statistics of the world is to try things and then we, we want to, we, we care about how long it takes us to find a good thing rather than just being able to run on data forever before we install in the real world. And when we install it in the real world, it becomes uh, fixed and is no longer allowed to change. To me, that's all wrong. We should continue to adapt once we interact with the world and we should always care about those costs that we incur. Um, yeah, okay. Okay, does this work? Yeah, um, I just have one question. Maybe you mentioned it in some of your papers, but um, you didn't mention it here, but do you still always assume that that you can formulate the entire process as, a, as an MDP or just a PO MDP maybe? So I'm just wondering if this is this still is, your um, good, general uh, assumption. Yeah, it's a good question. And to assume the world is an MDP, it is if you assume that also that you know the once that we have observations and we can only see part of the world, then arguably it's no longer a, a limitation. Um, and I guess I believe that. I believe it's, it's perfectly safe to assume the world is a really complicated MDP. I don't know what the states are, but there is one out there. It doesn't, doesn't help that much. It's, fine. It's, it's a good question, though. Is it, is it, it worth thinking about? Hi, Rich. Uh, good talk. So um, I think Super Dyna, uh, the way you framed it, is a you know general framework for uh, intelligence where we have to jointly learn you know the sub problems, the options, the reward function, uh, everything at once. Um, I guess my question is, can we ever kind of uh, model like true intelligence when uh, we we don't have all four assumptions? So, for example, in like a fully observable world or um, in a world where you know it is stationary, can we ever have a like a true model of intelligence 
when we kind of relax one of those assumptions? Well, to assume that you may have to learn the model um, is not an assumption. It's just the general case. Mm -hmm. So it's meant to be the general case. It would, so it would handle all the specific. Okay, sure. So, and, yeah, it would specialize to a tabular approach. It would specialize to some cases the model might be, might be known or might be thought to be known and it continue to adapt it. Is, is that your question? I guess like would intelligence in a fully observable world be different than intelligence in a world where it, things are, have, uh, you know, partial observability, right? It'll be easier. Right, yeah. But the way I'm dealing with partial observability is that rather than assuming we have the state, uh, the agent takes on the responsibility of producing the state. But in the end, it produces something that acts as, as, just as a state. Mm -hmm. and okay. So if we started with that, we'd be golden. So you're saying it'll be strictly easier. There's no, like, special different kind of intelligence that would exist in, okay. Thanks. Okay, um, hi. Uh, I think it's a very cool idea to see that uh, we, we, we look from a partial observation world and everything is changing. Uh, the question from, from me is that uh, uh, I think the information I got is that uh, we can tell, we can learn something that is changing, say like the value of the states or maybe the representation of states, but, uh, but still we have something that's still invariant here, like uh, uh, for example, how, how, how I uh, construct the state from observation. My question is that, uh, uh, say uh, we are in a general world, how do I tell before that uh, something is changing, something is not changing? For example, if the, uh, uh, the question is, if I learn some model, but uh, the next step, the world have a very big changing, uh, how do I, you know, adapt to that change uh, to, form a, to form very quickly to, to, to form a new model, adapt to that change? Yeah. So you want to... Um be able to vary the speed by which you adapt to the state or to the state features. You don't want to just go fast or, or, or go slowly. You want to be able to modulate that on a on a feature by feature basis, at least feature by feature basis. Um, and again, step size adaptation is designed for that. So the step size adaptation, I mentioned it twice now. Uh, it, this is my second favorite algorithm of all the, all, my first favorite algorithm, of course, is TD Lambda. But my, my first, second favorite algorithm is called, uh, it's a horrible name. It's called incremental delta bar delta, okay, or IDBID. The acronym is IDBID. And it is just, just it's, it, it's a method. So you make your, your network with your weights, and then each weight will have an, a variable step size. And it's sort of a, a gradient descent method for adjusting the step size. So it's really um, one of the first meta learning methods. IDBID, 1992. Okay. Uh, I really recommend you check it. If you enjoyed TD Lambda, try out IDBID. Okay. It's another simple, perhaps elegant uh, algorithm. Or, and it's for doing this step size adaptation, adjusting the speed by which the various parts of the system move based on. Gradient descent. It's gradient descent, so we should all like it, right? Good. So I have a question on goals Raise because it's here. Uh, we spent some time uh, describing the definition of intelligence, but we got to the adequacy of goals. Um, but we really didn't define what qualifies as a goal, and especially in processes like play, when process and goal could be the same. So how do we approach that in? Um, can RL kind of, how does our RL approach that? Good, good, good. So I use the word goal as an informal word. Uh, you know, that all, we can all think about what it means to us informally. And then to formalize them, we do a reward signal. So this is the way, uh, the more the, I, so goal intuitively suggests, you know, a, a particular a single state that you might be tried Something, something visual, whereas uh, a reward is a numerical measure that can vary from time to time, it can be stochastic. Um, yeah, so I am formulating in, in reinforcement the notion of goal as a reward signal, and that's claimed to be adequate. So the reward, if you know, pain would be low rewards, 
um, sub goals then have to do with value functions and the sub problems. But sorry, yeah. in terms of in terms of more creative processes, what we name as creative processes, um, how I guess so, like like the the uh, the child who's like creatively uh, she's proposing problems, the sub problems like you know she, something interesting. She feels something interesting in her hand. Well, I'm gonna see if I can get that to happen in the way I've set it up. But there. So that thing that happened. Suppose I. It, I, I say that was that was good to get there, and then I'll learn how to get there. So then, this book, this problem that she's created for herself, um, and then she, you know, she may get bored of that, and she would create another problem to work on. This is the, really the, the notion of how that the, that creativity comes about by proposing technically what are not new rewards, but are different things that you want to achieve. And as you as you you have your growing stable of features, you can have a growing set of things that you learn how to achieve. You know, so like the orangutan, the baby orangutan, it learns. Oh, I got that feeling as I was swinging there. Can I get that down again? Oh, can I get up on back up on the? As it's creatively exploring its world, find out what it can do, what it can't do, and how to achieve all those things. So this is the, the model of creativity. So, and what is creativity? Creativity is a way of of, of us getting a better and better, more useful model of the world. Um, yeah, so as we see different things, and we learn how to achieve them. And this is what we want. This is we want a cycle where we, you know, we, we propose you know, various features, we propose achieving them, and then as we try to achieve them, we, we get new features. And, and we can gradually build up a, a fuller and fuller understanding of how we can control our world, how we can predict. It all comes down to that what I started to do with my definition. Intelligence is learning to predict and control your data stream. And if you could, that it sounds like such a small thing, predict and control, but to really predict and control in all of its generality of those what those words mean is a big deal. Uh, to predict what you will see if you travel to it, uh, Edmonton, and and what what features might happen there? The feature might you might see might see me, or you might see someone else there. Those are are new features, and if you can really uh, have the ability to predict and control all those things, then you understand the world, even like a physical object. It's to fully um, understand how to predict and control that that data stream is to understand what it means to under, understand an object, and manipulate an object, and work with an object. Thank you for the talk. I wanted to ask you something uh, that you did not mention, namely safety. So when you are supposed to apply uh, this algorithm on a real robot, there will be questions of safety. So do you have any thoughts about how to in integrate that in the scheme? That's fun. Um, uh, safety. Safety could mean so many different things. Um, like I always think the primary meaning of safety should be robot safe. <laughs> Because that's what robot people who work with robots are really concerned about. They are hesitant to have to do trial and error learning with the robot because it would damage itself. Yeah. Uh, so I think I think AI safety should be about how the AI keeps itself safe. Um, is that what you meant? Or did you mean the other main meaning? Uh, no, I meant that. But uh, I mean uh, traditionally it's done through constraints, right? And that hampers the learning process. So if we apply constraints of, uh, about which states it can visit and what actions it can do, then uh, I'm not sure if that would naturally fit in this uh, scheme. Well, I certainly mean it to. Um, you, 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 the AI, the agent, doesn't take responsibility for the world. If you put it in a really dangerous world, it's going to be harm. If you let your 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 infant play on the street, it's going to be, um, and we do all the things to set up our infant's world so they don't hurt themselves. Um, that's not that's not the problem of intelligence. That's the problem of us working with intelligences. Um, 
So constraints. Constraints are, are, are meant to be another form, formulation of the goal. Achieve this while living within these constraints. And as someone who's trying to be minimalist and reductionist, I, I, I really hesitate to bring in new formalism, new concepts into my basic problem formulation. So I would, like to, I would, I would, I, I would strive really hard not to do that. I would strive to represent those things that you might call constraints as just other uh, aspects of the, of the reward signal. Thank you. There's another mic in the back, I think you can, if you can find it. But we're here first. Um, so it's in relation to the cake oh. metaphor yes. at the beginning. I've seen a few recent papers where they actually combined unsupervised learning and RL where they take the observation and project it into a concise uh, probabilistic representation. Yep. That's the latent representation, and then planning on top of that. I was wondering what's your thoughts about it? Well, I would have thought I was pretty clear about that. Uh, that's the way Jan LeCun would do it. <laughs> he would propose something different for the insides of the cake, and I would propose it would still be uh, reinforcement learning methods, temporal difference methods for, for predicting. So what, what Jan LeCun, I actually have a very, uh, a very uh, uh, common view, and also Yashua. Uh, these two people in particular, people have been thinking about how um, abstractly and ambitiously about AI. Uh, we both, all three of us, are saying, well, the important thing is to understand the world. Um, and how is we going to get an understanding of the world? How are we get, and that's why I would say, how are we going to come to be able to predict and control the world? Now, the mistake that might be being made by some people is to think that the model of the world is like a physics model. You know, I, I have the state, and I do this low-level action, and I'll go like physics. You know, things will go to the next differential equation model of the world. I think your, your model of the world, it's very, very important that it is temporally abstract. That it's, it's, it's some things like I could travel to Edmonton, or I could walk out and look for a cup of coffee, or I could say this word rather than that word. All of those are large things. They're not like the laws of physics. Or I could, yeah, I could say something, and and people might react, right? That's not going to be laws of physics. That, that's really important in our lives. It's how people react to what we say and do. And um, so we need a predictive model. The predictive model is not going to look like physics. It's going to look like knowledge. All the things we know about how the world works, what will be the consequences of the things we might do, when we plan our actions or our careers, we are guessing what will happen of, of long-term things. So you're advocating to a sample set again here, as opposed to learning a distribution? If I if I understand what you're saying. So knowledge would be a collection so of observations. The problem with those unsupervised learning methods is they are learning a one-step model. They're learning one-step transitions. That's, that's, and I think, you know, that's sort of un, 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 can't, you can't disagree with that. That's what people have been talking about. Now they will say, oh yeah, we'll deal with the temporal abstraction later. Maybe we'll have a higher level where you can plan over different time scales. And I just, so two things. One is it's all handled more, much more elegantly in terms of options. And two, once you are trying to predict things that are more than one step, you want to use temporal difference methods. That's temporal difference methods. That's the only reason for existence is, is that we, we have multi-step prediction problems. We don't want to predict one step. We want to make a prediction about an ultimate outcome, and then we want to predict and re-predict as we move along, and then we can compare one prediction with the next prediction and do temporal difference learning. And so what is sort of left out, and maybe this is true also uh, in the engineering thoughts about control, is that our models should be multi-step. And our predictions have to be multi-step. Value functions are obviously multi-step. You predict, am I going to win this game eventually? And you predict it on each move. But I think the models are also multi-step. And the models are involved in everything we do, including basic perception things. Like when you recognize an object, or a person, or a chair, or you're really uh, making a, a, a multi-step prediction. Like, oh, I think that's a thing that I could go sit down on, and I, I wouldn't fall fall down. And and then you add to somebody, you, you might take a closer look, you might walk up to it and say, oh, no, it's not a chair, it's just a picture of a chair. So I can't sit on that. So we learn these multi-step predictions by interaction with the world constantly, and that's how we do prediction. Thank you. I just have one point on Bitcoin. Yeah, it's, it's a quick question um, in a naive one. We'll do this one in the front. Um, I was intrigued by what you mentioned earlier about some of the success stories like Atari. The complexity of the agent is actually surpassing the complexity of the environment. Are there um, 
success stories in RL you'd point to today where the trend goes the other way, the environment is more complex than the agent? Um, well, Go is that way. Go is much more complex even than Google scale, scale computing. Certainly it would be backgammon that was much larger than the networks that Jerry Tassaro used in backgammon. So there are a few examples. Yeah. One last question. You had a question in the front? Right, right here. If we consider reinforcement learning as a learning to map situation to action, and I think that action is maximize profit or rewards. So is it rational action, I assume? If we consider that we have emotional action, which part could be changed? Okay, so maybe you won't like it, but I will. I would like to propose that the things that we are learning are emotions. We are learning our, our uh, a value function is an intuitive reaction to a position with before analysis, a positive or negative. Is this a good situation? Is this a bad situation? That's what a value function is. So when we're learning a value function, we are learning our, 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 our emotional reaction to, this, to, the, to, the, uh, to the state, good or bad. So I would say that, that uh, today's reinforcement learning systems have four emotions. One, pleasure and pain, which is high reward, low, low reward. No, yeah, yes, that's pain. And they, they also have the value function. You can have high value, which is different from a high reward, right? And you can have low value, which is different from low reward. So high value is like hope. And low value is a prediction that you're going to get low reward, so that's fear. So, you know, it's, it's a basic uh, emotional system, but it is, it's got hope and fear, pain and pleasure. I, would, I, I think it's appropriate to do, draw those analogies, you know, in contradiction to, you know, many philosophers will say, no, no robot, no agent, artificial agent could feel pain. I say, sure. So I like that, remember the guy who was running around the field? The, the thing, if we, if we ran a little bit longer, if I ran that video longer, you would have seen the, the little square would, would pursue the goal and then, and then I, I, I block off the goal from it, so it can't reach it at all. And then I block it up again, so it's, it's just stuck between two squares, going back and forth, da, 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 and it can't get the reward. And, and the reaction of, of everybody, and you would have this reaction if I played it that long, which is, oh, you feel sorry for the poor guy. The guy's frustrated. He's trying to get the reward, and there's no way you can do it. You've set up, you can't do it. And it feels uh, exactly as we'd be emotional about them, even though it's just a grid world and a simple problem. They can evoke those reactions. I think that's not inappropriate at all. Thank you for all your questions. Good. So everyone can join.
Alright. Welcome to Zoom. Enter your meeting ID followed by pound. Enter your participant ID. You are in the meeting now. There is one other participant in the meeting. Oh, here we go. And uh, can you folks hear? Are you going to have the projector on? No, there's, there's figuring stuff out. I hear them. All right, well, I'm going to run my, uh, get some coffee. Is anybody else want me to get some coffee? Yeah. Chips and I thought that's not enough. Wait, here. Can you hear? Yeah, sure. Alina, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear? Okay, good. Great. I mean, I can't really like this for putting Kobe so that she can see. 
Uh, oh. Yeah. Okay, so I should turn off the t-shirt? Yeah. Oh. I think you can hear us, right? Can you hear us, Quaid? I want, sorry. Um, Elena was just saying you can uh, say anything you want right now. Everyone's just picking up food, so if okay. you want to announce anything. Uh, so uh, just to be clear, starting next week, we'll have meetings at the one o'clock. Okay, okay. Right. Right. <laughs> the mics work, they just didn't say anything. Yeah. Like, wait, this is not a question, but it will happen at one next week. Correct. Okay. Yes, yes. What? Yeah, I, I did want to touch that a little bit uh, to give people the opportunity to raise any problems that they have. Them, but I don't think anybody has mentioned the problem. So let's start at one o'clock next week. We're going to be in Toronto. Next week. Okay. 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 Okay.